go, top of the hour, and we come on the air with breaking developments in two very big legal cases involving the former president, Mr. Trump. First, that huge blow to his real estate career. A New York judge has handed down a fine of more than $350 million and a three-year ban from New York's real estate business. We'll have more on the ruling and what it might mean for Mr. Trump's fight to retake the White House. And in Fulton County, Georgia, testimony just wrapping up in those hearings to decide if Fonnie Willis should be disqualified from her election interference case. She's pressing against Mr. Case. Mr. Trump, rather, will tell you about the dramatic testimony from Ms. Willis's father earlier today. In Russia, prison authorities there say Alexei Navalny, the top opposition figure to President Putin, is dead. The angry global response from President Biden and other world leaders. In Kansas City, charges filed against two juveniles and the deadly shooting at the Chiefs' victory parade. We'll tell you where that case heads next. Then the FDA has just approved a brand new treatment to fight the deadliest form of skin cancer. Why regulators think it could be a game changer for taking on melanoma. Good day, I'm Tom Costello. I'm in for Halley on this very busy Friday and yet another very big day in court for the former president. As a New York judge in Donald Trump's civil fraud trial has ordered him to pay more than $354 million in fines, the former president is calling that decision a complete and total sham. There's more. Judge Ngoron is also banning Mr. Trump from running business, businesses, plural, in New York for three years. It all stems from accusations from New York's attorney general that the former president inflated his assets to boost his net worth and receive financial perks out of it. Translation, false financial statements, financial fraud, inflated assets. Tonight, uh, the DA there, the attorney general, is calling the decision a tremendous victory for the state, while Mr. Trump's attorney calls it manifest injustice. His words, seen it as a culmination of a politically fueled witch hunt. His team is planning to appeal the decision. It all comes after two and a half months of testimony from dozens of witnesses, including the former president himself and his children, Eric, Don Jr., and Ivanka Trump, and his former lawyer and former friend turned enemy, Michael Cohen. And of course, all the fireworks we saw in and outside of the courtroom from the former president that led to a gag order and fines for defying that gag order. The decision caps off what's been a very consequential week on the former president's legal calendar. Yesterday, a judge ruled that the former president's hush money trial is going to start in late March. Also yesterday, the Fulton County, Georgia DA took the stand with explosive testimony that could undermine whether she is removed from Mr. Trump's Georgia election interference case. More on that in just a bit. Just those two cases, though, are really just a piece of the threads in this big legal web for the former president. And really, he is at the center of all of it. So NBC's Rahima Ellis is in New York. NBC's Von Hilliard is in West Palm Beach, Florida. And we've got Danny Savalos with us for a legal uh, analysis. Rahima, there is a very big number here. It's pretty close to what the AG in New York was asking for in terms of a fine. She did not get everything, though, right? The Trump Organization is not banned for life. Oh, that's right, Tom, and that is significant because some people thought that it could go that far, but the judge uh, didn't go that far. We should put up some of what you mentioned before. She had been looking for $370 million, but I want to show people that full screen. It comes up to about $355 million plus in terms of the decision that Trump is being ordered to pay. And he cannot be in business in New York for something like three years. In terms of how they responded, they called their, the judge, I should say, say their complete lack of contrition and remorse borders on pathological. That's coming from the judge in Goron in this case. And it's also important to point out here on Truth Social just a few moments ago, Trump responded to all of this saying that uh, it was a crooked New York judge working with a totally corrupt attorney general who ran for the office and on the notice that I will get Trump. He's been fined, he says. He says a fine coming to a man and a company who built a great company. So they are absolutely responding to this and saying in many ways what he said before he called it 
of election interference and a witch hunt. We have heard this from him many times before. He's repeating it tonight as he's been slapped with a pretty big fine of $355 million. And we should point out for his sons, there's a fine also of just a little over $400 million each. And both of his two adult sons would be banned for two years from doing business in New York. Tom? Uh, we know that the former president and his legal team are planning on appealing this, uh, and this is the second multi-million dollar judgment this year that the former president has been hit with. He's also, of course, been forced to pay a very big fine to E. Jean Carroll. Talk about how much of a gut punch this really might be for him, Raheem, if you don't mind. And we would remind the audience, uh, he is the author of Art of the Deal, but there's now quite a bit of speculation and the, the AG herself is saying, in fact, it is the art of the steel. Anyway, you read on the impact yeah. of his organization. <laughs> Well, it's a gut punch to the organization. Donald Trump became famous on the fact, as you point out, the art of the deal. He said that he was the ultimate businessman. And he never told people what the judge is saying now. It was built on a lie. It was built on fraud. The judge, when he ordered, when he issued that ruling last year, saying that the Trump organization and Trump had committed fraud in terms of their business filings, the judge said he was engaged in a fantasy world, not the real world. And and so people, therefore, according to this, have gone and supported Tr Donald Trump and his business prowess, according to the judge's ruling now, based on fraud. This tower behind me, Trump Tower, is his only fully owned business here, worth $156 million. But this is the heart of what Donald Trump is and the heart of his brand. And now he's been told it's a fraud and he's going to have to pay more than $355 million in penalties. Yeah. Tom? Yeah, and his name is a big part of that brand. Uh, Rahima, thank you very much. Let's bring in now NBC's Vaughn Hilliard outside of Mar-a-Lago there in Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, Vaughn, can you give us a sense now of what we might expect on the campaign trail? We've heard time and again uh, through several states, Republican voters say that even if Mr. Trump is convicted of some of the crimes he's still facing, by the way, he wasn't convicted here. He was rather, it was a decision, not a verdict. But they have said that they would still vote for him. So how much of an impact is this going to have on his base? Will they start, to, will there be cracks in the base if they start to believe that maybe he isn't exactly as advertised? He's not as wealthy as, as thought, and maybe there's an awful lot of financial fraud here. Right, Tom, I can't tell you the number of supporters of his who have defended him from these charges and making the case that, by and large, they grew to love and admire him because of the business empire that he had built. And I have little reason to believe that this will undercut that. However, for, you know, independents or some conservatives who uh, have been willing to vote for Democrats in the past, this could potentially, the fact that these are no longer allegations, but a judge has been have found him to be liable for repeated financial fraud could be enough to change their vote here. And when you're talking about for Democrats and Joe Biden, of course, they're looking in November, but there is still one Republican candidate taking him on, and that's Nikki Haley. Now, now, her time is running short. The Trump team believes that they have uh, potentially the number of delegates needed for him to become the presumptive nominee as soon as March 19th, just one month from now. But I want to let you listen to Nikki Haley last night after a campaign stop in Texas in which she talked about Donald Trump's criminal proceedings. He said he's going to spend more time in a courtroom than he is going to be on the campaign trail. But let me tell you what we're going to be doing. We're going to be on the campaign trail. Of course, this decision was a part of a civil trial from stemming from the New York Attorney General's office, but he still has those four pending criminal trials that await him, some including one starting as soon as March 25th in New York, Tom. And this is shaping up to be a very busy campaign season for Mr. Trump, right? Right. When you start to look at this calendar, this is where it becomes complicated. Again, March 19th is the day that they believe uh, uh, there are going to be a couple primaries, including the state of Arizona. And they believe if they have big wins in some of these states, including Super Tuesday, places like California on March 5th, that they're going to be able to declare themselves 
the Republican nominees the, after gaining the, the threshold of the another number of delegates needed. But you see what happens just six days after March 19th. On March 25th is when the hush money payment trial in Manhattan is slated to begin. And then after that, we're expecting a, about a six week trial in that case, potentially the federal election interference case that could begin in the heart of the summer as soon as June or July. So for Donald Trump, uh, if he does win this Republican nomination, his general election, his schedule will be clouded by the fact that he's going to have legal proceedings that he's going to be obligated to attend, Tom. Yeah, Vaughn, thank you very much. Vaughn Hilliard down in Florida. Let's go now to Danny Savalos for a legal analysis. And I've been watching you all day, Danny. Uh, we know that this will be tied up for years on appeal. But how does now New York State secure the fine, the $355 million that he's been hit with? And then uh, how do they go about barring him, keeping him out of the doing business for the next three years during the appellate process? Well, first, the money, and you've seized on a major problem in getting a big verdict or a judgment is often collection. That's why most cases end up settling, because even if you get a gigantic verdict, there's always the chance that the defendant will appeal or... Uh, that they'll seek a stay and uh, they may be successful on appeal. And another thing people don't normally talk about is that the appellate court, in cases of big verdicts, might reduce it on appeal unilaterally on its own. So uh, with that in mind, most parties come together and say, well, money today is better than maybe money tomorrow. And Trump and his co-defendants will not be paying this money tomorrow. That is not going to happen, at least as far as the business certificates go. That is going to be the subject in all likelihood of ongoing monitoring by uh, retired Judge Barbara Jones, who has already been appointed as a monitor in this case. Uh, and she has a history of doing that, right? She was involved also in, in a high profile NFL case of monitoring that case as well. You, you've been you've been watching this very closely all day. You've read the entire document from the judge. Does it appear to you that there are any windows, obvious windows for appeal, or has, has this judge really locked that down pretty tightly? Well, the reason Judge Justice Ngoron wrote such a long opinion is that he wanted to cover all the bases for exactly that reason. He knows that this opinion is going to be scrutinized on appeal by many eyes. So they took some time on it. That's why when I'm often asked, what's the timeline on an opinion on a Trump case? Well, I can tell you what the normal timeline is, but you better believe judges on a Trump case are going to sit down and put in a few extra hours on a Friday evening and on the weekends working on these opinions. Uh, and I can tell you, I can show you uh, never ending Supreme Court justice decisions that are handwritten, literally scribbled one or two lines. That is not going to be this opinion. This opinion, 92 pages of thoughtful, reasoned opinion. Danny, thank you. Danny Savalos. Let's now talk about what's happening down in Georgia. The fate of Fulton County's election interference case against Donald Trump is now moving to closing arguments with the evidence wrapping up in just the past half hour or so in a hearing that could disqualify the D.A. there, Fannie Willis, and her office in this case. In an unexpected twist, Willis opted not to appear today, a day after that fiery testimony yesterday where she disputed the timeline put out by an ex-friend about when D.A. Willis started a personal relationship with the special prosecutor she hired, Nathan Wade. Instead, we heard today from Georgia's former governor and Willis's own father, who was asked about his understanding of that relationship timeline. When you were living at um, Ms. Willis's house in Fulton County, uh, did you ever meet Mr. Wade in uh, the year 2019? Absolutely not. How about in the year 2020? Absolutely not. Did you ever see Mr. Wade at Ms. Uh, Willis's uh, Fulton County house in the year two, uh, 2021? Never. Okay, all those dates, all those years matter because the Trump team accuses Willis of financially benefiting from an improper relationship with Wade. Though, so far, they've not presented any evidence of that. Willis and Wade don't deny a relationship, but when it started matters, since that would go to the heart of any alleged impropriety here. MSNBC's Katie Fang is in Atlanta. Katie, you've been watching this one all day, all day yesterday as well. And the Trump side's witness today, Terrence Bradley, did not give the answers that the Trump team wanted, right? Explain how he fits into the case. 
Yeah, so Tom, this witness, Terrence Bradley, who was the former divorce lawyer of Nathan Wade, as well as a former law partner, was called on behalf of the defense. If you'll recall, there was kind of an attempted calling of him as a witness yesterday, but he definitely took the stand, albeit a little bit late today. And when he took the stand, he said the following about his basis of knowledge as to the personal relationship between Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis. Take a quick listen. I have no personal knowledge of when it actually happened. Um, I was not there. I do not have any personal knowledge, so okay. I would choose not to answer that question. Now, Tom, the reason why his testimony seemed very guarded is because as the former attorney for Nathan Wade, there's something called the attorney-client privilege, and that came into play significantly today. Lots of oral arguments and legal arguments between both sides as to what he, as in Terrence Bradley, could and could not testify to. It ended up very much limiting the scope of that, but the reason why his testimony about why he didn't have personal knowledge was so important is because everything he learned about that personal relationship between Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis came from that attorney-client relationship and that is why it was not elicited in terms of testimony today. I will note, Tom, the testimony took a very bizarre and unexpected turn for Terrence Bradley a little bit later on. He was questioned on cross-examination by the state of Georgia about sexually assaulting an employee at the law firm that he shared with Nathan Wade and another attorney. He denied those allegations, but obviously the reason why those questions were asked on cross-examination was to set up the lack of credibility that perhaps Terrence Bradley had. That's interesting. Uh, all right, Willis's father, D.A. Willis's father, also talked about the threats that Willis, the, the, the D.A., has faced as she has prosecuted or is prosecuting Trump in this election interference case, right? So how does the father's testimony about the threats his daughter has faced, how does that all fit in here? Well, it fits in two different ways, Tom. One is the humanization of these witnesses. We have heard about the death threats and the threats of violence to Fonnie Willis. Obviously, it affected her father as well. But it also speaks to the timing of when Fonnie Willis lived in certain residences, who she was dating, whether or not the father of Fonnie Willis was able to see these boyfriends or the people with whom that she was spending time. And that's the reason why it became relevant. But really, I think the key component of it, Tom, again, was the humanization, the idea that just by prosecuting this case, being a duly elected official, Fonnie Willis, her family, her children have now become the victims of death threats and threats of violence. Katie, let's get out of the weeds and go to the 10,000-foot view, if you could, of the forest. Because thus far, has there sure. been any evidence presented in court that in any way the DA financially benefited from hiring Wade? That's the bottom line. No. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Tom. You are right. This is an evidentiary hearing. So what is the evidence of the improper financial benefit? We've heard nothing. And that is going to be the important thing for the judge to consider in this case. As an evidentiary hearing, the only thing that he can rely upon is not arguments, not filings, but the evidence that came through witnesses and documentary evidence. At this point in time, we have not heard anything that would speak to any type of improper financial benefit that was received by Fonnie Willis or even Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Katie, thank you. Katie Fang in Atlanta for us. All right, let's turn to Russia now. The world-famous opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, is reportedly dead. The country's prison service says Navalny, a prominent critic of President Vladimir Putin, who spent his final years behind bars, died in an Arctic penal colony. He was only 47. Already, news of his death is drawing outrage from many Western leaders who are pointing the blame squarely at Vladimir Putin. Take a listen. There is no doubt that the death of Navalny was a consequence of something that Putin and his, and his thugs did. Navalny's wife received a standing ovation at a security conference in Munich today where she issued a strong warning to the Kremlin. I want them to know that they will be punished for what they have done with our country, with my family, and with my husband. And Navalny's, uh, Navalny's life as an opposition leader also put a target on his back. He, he was arrested countless times, attacked with some toxin with a green dye twice, even poisoned with a military nerve agent that nearly killed him back in 2020. And just in December, Navalny went missing for a time before reappearing 
at a at that remote Arctic penal colony where he died. And we've got team coverage of this. Josh Letterman is in London, and Ali Rafa is uh, right across the street from the White House. Josh, can we start with you? Talk about Navalny's legacy and how global leaders are now reacting to this news tonight. And is there anything the outside world can do? Well, Tom, he leaves a legacy of defiance, is really the most prominent face of the opposition to Vladimir Putin for many years. Uh, this is a country uh, where speaking out against Putin and the Kremlin uh, is very dangerous, as, as Alexei Navalny appears to have paid for with his life. And so he leaves really a vacuum behind uh, of strong opposition figures uh, who can stand up publicly uh, to Vladimir Putin. There was a really dramatic moment at the Munich Security Conference today uh, in Germany, where Navalny's widow, Yulia uh, Navalny, said, she happened to be there, said, look, I consider just going home to be with my children given this moment. And then I realized, no, if I were Alexei Navalny, my husband, uh, I would be standing here speaking out publicly. Listen to what she had to say. I would like to call upon all the international community, all the people in the world, we should come together and we should fight against this evil. We should fight this horrific regime in Russia today. And Tom, you asked what the world can do. Uh, aside from strong condemnations, there may not be that much because uh, Western nations have kind of tapped out uh, their economic penalties, sanctions against Russia during the war in Ukraine over the last couple of years. President Biden has talked about some options. Uh, and today, just in the last few minutes, we heard from the British foreign ministry saying they have summoned the Russian embassy uh, to answer for what happened to Navalny. Real quickly, Josh, what, what is Russia saying? What's the Kremlin saying about this? Russia is saying that it's absurd for other countries to point the finger at them without providing any evidence, uh, but they are also making clear they're not going to tolerate any dissent. We have seen tonight arrests of protesters showing up to support Navalny, both in Moscow and in President Putin's hometown of St. Petersburg, Tom. Josh, thank you. Josh Letterman, who's in London. Uh, Ali Rafa at the White House, let's go to you. What more are you hearing from the White House tonight? Yeah, Tom, well, we've already heard Vice President Kamala Harris come out at that security conference that you mentioned where NATO allies, among other things, were actually discussing how to counter Russia's aggression. The vice president coming out and uh, underscoring Russia's culpability in all of this, but also stressing how the U.S. was still trying to independently verify these reports of Navalny's death. Take a listen to more of her comments this morning. My prayers are with his family, including his wife, Yulia, who is with us today. And if confirmed, this would be a further sign of Putin's brutality. Whatever story they tell, let us be clear, Russia is responsible. Harris and Secretary of State Antony Blinken both meeting with Navalny's uh, widow after she delivered those remarks you heard Josh talk about. And then, of course, we heard from President Biden at the White House earlier, a world leader with an enormous amount of respect for Navalny. And that was very evident in his remarks, where he said that Navalny was everything that Russian President Putin wasn't. And he laid the blame for his death squarely at President Putin's feet. As far as what happens now, though, Tom, you heard uh, Josh talking about any options to be able to, uh, any consequences that Russia could face because of this. That is something uh, that President Biden warned about after a high stakes meeting that he had with President Putin in 2021. He was asked what would happen if Navalny were to die in prison. And he said that the consequences for Russia would be, quote, devastating. He was again asked about that today and said Russia, in the years since he made that comment, has faced consequences, but he said his administration is considering an additional list of options, whether that could be uh, seizing of Russian assets in the United States, more sanctions. That is still uh, unclear, Tom. Ali, thank you. Ali Rafa at the White House for us. All right, in just the last few hours, the DA has filed charges against two teenagers who police say were involved in Wednesday's shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs victory parade that left one person dead, 22 others injured or wounded. Two juvenile suspects now facing firearm and resisting arrest charges, with more charges likely. Police say that the two were part of an argument that then turned violent. 
Meanwhile, survivors today got their first chance to go back to retrieve personal belongings left behind when that shooting started as the tributes to the victims continue, including the woman who was killed, 43-year-old Lisa Lopez Galvin, a popular local radio DJ. A GoFundMe set up by her family has already blown through its goal of raising $75,000 for the family, thanks to Taylor Swift, who donated $100,000, writing, quote, sending my deepest sympathies and condolences in the wake of your devastating loss. NBC's Maggie Vespa is in Kansas City for us. Maggie, more charges likely against these two teenagers, we understand. And in the meantime, the victims, the wounded, still recovering. They are, and Tom, we also should know more charges likely, but also quite possibly more suspects. Police say they haven't closed the door on that. So again, the investigation continues. But yeah, the pain, as you talked about, I mean, these, these victims are still recovering. Many of them will be recovering for some time. And again, just the emotional turmoil, as we see time and time again in these mass shootings, is immense. Earlier today, speaking of, I talked to one of the youngest wounded, 10-year-old Samuel Ariano. He was at uh, the rally on Wednesday with his family. He loves Patrick Mahomes. He wanted to see his favorite player on the stage. When he heard the gunshots, this is incredibly heartbreaking. His active shooter training from school kicked in, and he hid behind a garbage can. At one point, though, he says he had to put his hand up over his eyes to shield his eyes from the sun, and that's when he felt a stinging uh, near his rib cage. later realizing that he had indeed been shot. Here's part of our conversation. What did you think when they told you that, that it was centimeters away from your lungs? I started to cry. Why? But, like, I was kind of happy because if it hit my lungs, it would have been a different situation. A whole, like, bad one because I would have started bleeding. Thank God I was bleeding. Like, I wasn't bleeding. Again, he's 10 years old. He's in the fifth grade. I asked what he wants to do when he gets older. He says he wants to play football, maybe be a quarterback. In the meantime, I asked him about his thoughts on the fact that, again, that bullet was just centimeters away from his lungs. And he said the fact that it didn't hit his lungs, Tom, is a miracle. So an incredible kid. But again, the youngest among the wounded, eight years old, Sam close to it. And it's just incredible and heartbreaking to see them impacted like this, obviously. Yeah, he looks like a baby. Uh, it's just just astonishing. Uh, talk about the, the all the money raised to help the family, including this big donation from Taylor Swift. How else uh, are people helping, and how else is money coming in? And by the way, the team response as well. Yeah, yeah, that. The team response, too. Yeah, we'll talk about Taylor Swift. That came in overnight. That surprised us. It was actually two $50,000 donations to GoFundMe because GoFundMe puts a cap on donations. So she donated twice the maximum amount uh, to the family of Lisa Lopez Galvan, who you talked about, a local radio DJ. We talked to her family yesterday who said she's a pillar in the community. Also, we have new photos of Patrick Mahomes visiting girls at a local children's hospital earlier today. Those photos came from the girls' family, the Reyes family, and they also released a statement. You see Mahomes and his wife there. The family saying, we're happy to share that our daughters, ages 8 and 10, so we're talking about the youngest victims here again, are making good progress in their recovery from their leg injuries. Both girls were shot in the legs, underwent surgery, and are currently in cast for several months. The girls were celebrating with many family members when they were senselessly injured. So again, the number of kids injured in this is really what gets you. We had 22 people wounded. More than half of them, Tom, were younger than 16 years old. That says it all. I've got two daughters. It resonates. Maggie, thank you very much. Maggie Vespa. Coming up from us, what a bunch of big tech companies are pledging to do to prevent their AI software from interfering with elections this year. Plus, why NASA is saying Martians wanted and you can apply. Stay tuned. Bottom of the hour, and this is really big for some cancer patients. The FDA today approving a groundbreaking cancer therapy that could be a lifesaver for patients with an advanced form of skin cancer. The therapy has been used in clinical trials for patients with advanced metastatic melanoma, the most dangerous form of skin cancer, usually considered a death sentence. According to those clinical trials, though, 30 to 40 percent of patients who received the TIL therapy saw their cancer shrink or disappeared. Dr. Kavita Patel is one of our favorites. She's joining us now. 
All right, medicine for dummies, science for dummies. What does this mean? How does it work? It is truly groundbreaking. Decades going into research around TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Tom, think about your own natural produced immune cells that then get taken out and extracted, engineered, and then fight the cancer. People have been pursuing this for years. Only today did we get FDA therapy approved telling us that we can do this for tumors like melanoma consistently across patient populations. So I'm going to ask you something that I don't know the answer to. I mean, how similar is this to hormone, hormone replacement therapy, which has also proven to be very effective? Yeah, so hormone replacement therapy, very effective. And this is kind of a stage beyond because okay. you're taking your own cells and then trying to help them do what they really want to do, which is fight things that are foreign. Cancer cells are foreign. So hormone therapy, cell, hormone therapy itself actually activates at the receptors of those cells. So these are very much different therapies, but the TIL, these therapies are just the beginning. This is gonna open up all new opportunities, especially in solid tumors. We've seen this before in what we call blood tumors, think like leukemia. This is the first in a solid tumor and what's coming soon is just incredible. And advanced melanoma can be very deadly, very right? Painful. So if you yeah. have that, or if your loved one has it, yeah. there may be some real hope here. Absolutely, they're gonna start to roll it out. Remember, this is not something you can just manufacture in a regular lab. You really need to have centers that understand how to do this. You're taking out patient cells, you're engineering and changing mm -hmm. some things, and then putting them back in. So about 25 centers is what the drug company thinks that they'll start with that are in across the United States that have experience, expanding that across the United States to have more access this is really for patients who have failed some of our standard therapy for melanoma or have what we call metastatic melanoma, mm -hmm. meaning the cancer is so far spread that normally we don't have anything to offer them. You know, doctor, it seems like every week or every month we're getting good yeah. treatment news on cancer. We are. But there's a lot of that, a lot of breakthroughs right now. A lot of hope. I really hope people understand screening, all of it, there are breakthroughs. But I want people to not forget the basics, that we can get screening and try to prevent anything from getting to the stage where we have to use a, a therapy like this. So I, I think that this is an incredible time. And I also want to pay tribute to the people who are in trials. We wouldn't have gotten to this point without volunteers to go through these trials to get us through these breakthroughs. And sunscreen, sunscreen, sun, sunscreen, sunscreen, right? sunscreen, sunscreen, sun right. protection, even in the shade, even now, when I, it's cloudy I'm told outside. that all the time by That's my right. dermatologist, Dr. Patel. Thank you. Thank you. Great info. Uh, all right, let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you might want to know about tonight. Number one, today the jury started deliberating in the New York civil trial against the NRA and its former CEO, Wayne LaPierre. Jurors will decide whether LaPierre took millions of dollars away from the group for himself and whether other execs broke laws for their own benefit. If the jury finds them liable, they'll recommend how much each person should pay, repay the NRA. LaPierre says he has already repaid what he owed. Number two, Senator Joe Manchin making news today. He will not run for president this year after debating it for months. Many had speculated he might run after he said he wasn't going to seek re-election to the Senate. Manchin says it just doesn't feel like the right time to make a third party run for the presidency. He does say he will help make sure the country gets a president who can bring the country together. Number three, an NBC News exclusive, a whistleblower report sent to Congress today says the top customs and border protect protection doctor pressured his staff to order fentanyl lollipops for him to take to a UN meeting in New York. The report says he suggested the lollipops would help with pain management in case of an emergency. He ended up not getting the lollipops in time. Number four, Prince Harry, living in LA, just said he's considered becoming an American citizen, though he says it's not a top priority right now. He also says he jumped on a plane to the UK right away after his dad, King Charles, called and said he had cancer. Number five, attention all Martian wannabes. NASA looking for you. It's recruiting people to join its next year-long Mars simulation project. Here's the first crew right there. Basically, four volunteers live and work inside a 3D printed habitat in Houston that's less than 2,000 square feet. NASA put out the sneak peek at the habitat before the first group started. It simulates what a mission to Mars might be like with simulations of equipment failures, resource limitations, and even spacewalks. NASA is taking applicants through the start of April. 
20 tech companies today announced steps to prevent their AI tools from interfering with elections. Big names like Microsoft and Google, as well as some smaller startups, have signed, signed on to this pledge, but the pledge falls short of an outright ban on AI content in elections. Now, remember, just last month, robocalls using AI were sent out mimicking President Joe Biden's voice. The fake calls tried to discourage people from voting in New Hampshire's primary. This year could be the biggest election year in history with elections happening in seven of the world's 10 most populous countries. NBC's Dave Ingram joins me now. Dave, uh, can you walk us through now the steps that these companies have said that they will take this year to prevent election interference with AI? That's right, Tom. So these are eight steps that these companies are taking voluntarily. This is uh, what's becoming kind of an industry-wide consensus with big companies and small companies saying they're going to take each of these steps on their own to try to limit the impact of AI in elections. So there are some pretty basic steps. Uh, one is just being able to distinguish between what is AI-made content and what is authentic content, much harder than it sounds, especially when you're looking at things like video and audio. Images are a little bit easier. Um, responding to events as, as they come up are, is, is very important. I mean, as you mentioned with the Biden tape, um, I, you know, the U.S. government and a lot of other people are just being reactive at this point because we don't know what is going to be coming down the pike from campaigns and from other actors to use uh, this content. And then just being transparent with the public. Um, not Companies don't always have the best um, reputation, especially in the tech industry, to say what is happening behind the scenes. And so hopefully we're going to be seeing more of that. And then there are about five other steps that they, that they laid out as well. But, but the rate of AI development has just really taken off. I mean, ChatGPT was launched in 2022, and, and just yesterday we had OpenAI roll out this text-to-video generative AI model. It's developing so fast. How are election systems ever going to keep up with, with AI? That's a great question, and it sort of underscores uh, what's remarkable about this accord, which is that these companies are themselves admitting that their own products are going to have this potentially huge downside in an election year, that, that their products are potentially going to undermine democracy. And, and this is companies large and small saying this, Meta, Google, as well as some startups. And so I think what we're going to have to see is uh, civil society governments around the world beginning to look through these steps, integrate these steps into their own regulations and laws, and there'll be some kind of consensus. All right, Dave Ingram, thank you very much. Good story there. When we come back, the latest on where the ceasefire talks stand right now in the war between Israel and Hamas, plus new satellite images show a big construction effort on the Egyptian side of the border with Gaza. Why? Later, how an all-out search for a robbery suspect ended and a reporter's, one of our reporters, backyard. Back in a minute. Okay, you know what we do here, original journalism. And so we have one tonight, in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. The Golden Gate Bridge has finished adding nets along the sides. You can see them right there. They're meant to deter people from jumping off the bridge. And bridge managers say they're already helping. The bridge once saw an average of 30 confirmed suicides a year. But in 2023, while the nets were still under construction, there were 14. And now that all nets are in place, the hope is that they can save many more lives. Here's NBC's Jick Ward. The Golden Gate Bridge is an American icon of strength and perseverance. But for too many people, it symbolizes something else. I drove myself here because I felt like I needed to get myself out of pain. I remember seeing him when I stopped and getting off of my motorcycle. He, he appeared to look my direction, and that's when he just went and jumped. So I had yelled something to him. Whatever he yelled was enough to distract me enough and pull me out of that dark place that I was in. I thought he was gone. I went running up there, and then I see his T-shirt through the slots. I talked to him for 92 minutes, and my head never looked up. It was something in his voice, the compassion in his voice, and that's what saved me. Years after Highway Patrolman Kevin Briggs interrupted Kevin Berthea's suicide attempt, 
Berthea does not shy away from his lowest moment. I wear it proudly because I want people to know that your, your worst days prepare you for your best days. On average, 30 people have leapt to their deaths here each year, more than 2,000 since 1937, according to bridge authorities. The first recorded suicide occurred within the first few months of the bridge's opening. And when Briggs started patrolling the bridge in the 90s, part of his job was to look out for people who might be on the edge. I would average four to six people a month who were either on the side Sidewalk, we would see and, and talk to, or maybe in their car writing a note, wow. thinking about it, or up and over that rail. He talked with hundreds of people and helped many of them, sharing the stories in a book called Guardian of the Golden Gate. But it wasn't until now, after years of suicide prevention advocacy and studies of the power of deterrence, that bridge authorities installed these steel nets, a $224 million project. The way the nets are designed, you don't even really see them unless you're right above them. You talk to the few people who survived a jump from the bridge, and almost to a person, they'll say, the second their hands left the railing, their life flashed before their eyes, and they experienced immediate regret. And the nets offer a second chance. The net has a deterrent effect for two reasons. One is it visually interrupts your view of the water. It reminds you that it's there, and other people have been here before you. And two, it's designed to hurt. Falling 20 feet into taut steel mesh is evidently like falling into a cheese grater. It's not going to end your pain. It's going to make it worse. And those two things together are working. In the first year they put this in, before it was even finished, suicides at this bridge fell by half. There's research and study that shows if you're able to get people through the peak of their pain, that often they do not go on to attempt and go on to live long and productive lives. That's true for Kevin Berthea. These two men from opposite sides of the bridge are now friends and peers in suicide prevention. They say these nets are a crucial last line of defense. Something got to be in place. Something, yeah. you know, has to be in place to say that we care. Those folks who come across there and all of a sudden, I've had enough. That's what this will hopefully prevent. Yeah. Then it did its job. And perhaps someday everyone who walks onto the Golden Gate Bridge will walk off. Now, let's be clear, this is not a solution to the mental health crisis that we're seeing in this country and around the world, where suicide rates are, in fact, going up in many cases. And so we're going to need, experts say, a, a total overhaul of how we do mental health. But this kind of architectural intervention really can be effective. And it's not just at the Golden Gate Bridge. This is something we're seeing around the world at icons, uh, sculptures, statues, bridges, towers, all of them putting in this kind of system for exactly the same reason. It visually interrupts and as a result psychologically interrupts that moment that people have and perhaps can get them on a new path. Back to you. Let's hope so. Jake Ward, thank you very much. All right, if you or anybody you, need, you know needs help, you can reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by calling or texting 988. Or you can text HOME to the crisis text line, 741-741. Still to come from us, how one Tulsa community destroyed more than a century ago is now building the next generation of black entrepreneurs. Stay with us. We're back and we have breaking news coming to us right now out of New York. New York Attorney General Letitia James speaking after that historic ruling, a judge ordering Donald Trump to pay more than $350 million in damages in that civil business fraud trial. James brought against the former president, and we will listen in as soon as she takes the stand. We are also waiting on the former president, Mr. Trump, to speak. Here now, the Attorney General of New York. Good evening. Today, justice has been served. Today, we prove that no one is above the law, no matter how rich, powerful, or politically connected you are. Everyone must play by the same rules. We have a responsibility to protect the integrity of the marketplace. And for years, Donald Trump engaged in deceptive business practices and tremendous fraud. Donald Trump falsely, knowingly, inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself, his family, and to cheat the system. Donald Trump may have authored the art of the deal, but he perfected the art of the steal. This long-running fraud was intentional, egregious, illegal. And he did it all of this, he did all of this with the help of the other defendants, his two adult sons, 
and senior executives at the Trump Organization. And so, after 11 weeks of trial, we showed the staggering extent of his fraud and exactly how Donald Trump and the other defendants deceived banks, insurance companies, and other financial institutions for their own personal gain. We proved just how much Donald Trump, his family, and his company unjustly benefited from his fraud. Today, the court once again ruled in our favor and in favor of every hardworking American who plays by the rules. Donald Trump and the other defendants were ordered to pay $463.9 million. That represents $363.9 million in disgorgement, plus $100 million in interest, which will continue to increase every single day until it is paid. Donald Trump, the former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, and the former controller of the Trump Organization, Jeffrey McConney, are each banned from serving as an officer or director of any New York company for three years. Mr. Weisselberg and Mr. McConney are also banned for life from serving in a financial management role in any New York company. Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump are banned from serving as an officer or director of any New York company for two years. And Donald Trump and his companies are banned from applying for loans from any New York bank or financial institution for three years. A new independent director of compliance will be created at the Trump Organization to ensure the company establishes internal protocols and meets financial reporting obligations. And the current independent external monitor will continue to oversee the company's financial dealings and ensure this fraud cannot continue. I want to be clear. White collar financial fraud is not a victimless crime. When the powerful break the law and take more than their fair share, there are fewer resources available for working people, small businesses and families. And everyday Americans cannot lie to a bank about how much money they have in order to get a mortgage to buy a home or a loan to keep their business afloat or to send their child to college. And if they did, our government would throw the book at them. I want to thank the entire incredible and hardworking team in my office that tried this case. Because the scale and the scope of Donald Trump's fraud is staggering. And so too is his ego and his belief that the rules do not apply to him. Today, we are holding Donald Trump accountable. We are holding him accountable for lying, cheating, and a lack of contrition, and for flouting the rules that all of us must play by. Because there cannot be different rules for different people in this country, and former presidents are no exception. This decision is a massive victory for every American who believes in that simple but fundamental pillar of our democracy, that the rule of law applies to all of us equally, fairly, and justly. Thank you. That is the New York Attorney General Letitia James speaking after a former President Donald Trump uh, learned of the penalty that he will be facing as a result of the allegations, and now he has been found that he did commit financial fraud in New York. Here are the numbers, and we just uh, wanted to run through them one more time, because the, Mr. Trump alone is facing $355 million in fines, plus $98 million in interest. And that's why the, the number goes up to $453 million. And then also uh, the, the Trump sons also have to pay fines, as does Al Alan Weisselberg. So a lot of money there, and that raises a lot of questions. So let's quickly, if we can, go to our uh, legal analyst, Danny Savalos. And da Danny, I think the very first question is going to be, um, I guess we have a New York retired judge, Barbara Jones, who's going to monitor and oversee this. 
So how quickly does she step into that role? In other words, they have to start paying money right away or not until the appeals process works its way through? And, and what if they shift funds in the meantime? Yeah, you bring up a very good point. I mean, these businesses are going concerns. This is not a an inert uh, entity that you figure out what you're going to do with the business charter and everything else. Every day they exist, presumably they're doing business, and that may require lines of credit, other things that gigantic businesses normally require. And that is why there is a monitor that will fall largely on uh, retired Judge Barbara Jones, who will continue to monitor this. You ask about where does the money go? The money presumably goes to the state. The banks who lost out on their interest uh, not only were not parties to this action, uh, some of them actually testified that they didn't suffer any losses. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, no, the money will largely or completely go to the state. But none of it, no checks are going to be written tomorrow. Uh, in yeah. all likelihood, the defendants will do everything they can to seek a stay, whether they have to file uh, post a bond. That's another issue for them to have to contend with. But they will take this up on appeal to the appellate division, first department. And I believe they do get an appeal as of right to the court of appeals. Normally, appeals to a state Supreme Court are not of right. I believe they get one as of right on this issue. Okay. Uh, Danny, stand by, if you don't mind. We're going to go to Rahema Ellis here, uh, NBC News in New York, and we are waiting right now on the former president to speak. Uh, we have a live shot of Mar-a-Lago. He'll be expected any minute. But Rahema, uh, this is not the only penalty that Mr. Trump is facing, right? We mentioned $453 million on this, including the interest. He's also got $83 million to pay in the E. Jean Carroll case and $25 million in the Trump University fraud case. So now we are well over... $500 million, and there are a lot of questions about, can he pay that money? Yeah, he has said that he is worth, uh, in cash, over $400 million. Now, that's what he has said. We've heard other people on our air uh, earlier today who are saying, you can't always believe what Donald Trump says. Uh, this decision against him sort of backs that up. But that is what he's saying. But would he liquidate all $400 million to go towards these judgments against him? That's a big question, too. But you're right. They are lining up like airplanes on a runway the amount of penalties that he's now been ordered to pay as a result of engaging in fraudulent activity. The Trump Organization has responded. Uh, former President Trump himself on Truth Social not so long ago, he called it a crooked state judge working with a totally corrupt attorney general who ran on the basis of, I will get Trump, end quote, before knowing anything about me or my company, just find me $355 million based on nothing other than having built a great company. This is election interference witch hunt. More to follow. That more to follow, we expect, as you pointed out, Tom, will come shortly. We expect to see yeah. the former president um, on camera. Tom? Okay. In fact, we expect it in less than 60 seconds. We'll take a live shot of the podium, and I want to talk to NBC's Von Hilliard, who's down there in Mar-a-Lago. And Von, we know what the, uh, not the tweets, but the social media, social media uh, statements have been. What do you expect to hear from former President Trump when he comes out? Right, Tom. Donald Trump has made it clear here over the course of the last months that he would go on the offensive here. You know, there's, I guess, two different strategies one could uh, deploy in order to hey, fight. Hey, Vaughn, I got to interrupt you. Here's the, here's the former president. A New York state judge just ruled that he's crooked as you can get. And a lot of people expected something like this, but not for the amount. Uh, but this is a very dishonest man. This is a man that's been overturned already on this case four times. But a crooked New York State judge just ruled that I have to pay a fine of $355 million for having built a perfect company. Uh, great cash, great buildings, great everything. It affects New York. It's mostly talking about New York, where we have a totally corrupt attorney general. She campaigned on the fact that I will get Trump, I will get Trump. Everybody's seen it. Letitia James, they've all seen it. Well, we'll be appealing, but more important than that, this is Russia, this is China, this is the same game. All comes out of the DOJ, it all comes out of Biden. It's a witch hunt against his political opponent, the likes of which our country has never seen before. You see it in third world countries, banana republics, but you don't see it here. So I just want to say this. You build a great company, there was no fraud, 
The banks all got their money, 100 percent. They love Trump. They testified that Trump is great, great customer, one of our best customers. They testified beautifully. And the judge knows that. He's just a corrupt person. And we knew that from the beginning. We knew it right from the beginning, because he wouldn't give it to the commercial division. This judge thought Mar-a-Lago is worth $18 million, and it's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times that amount. So we realized that. He ruled against me before he even got the case. He ruled against me. He said I was guilty. He didn't know what I was guilty of before he even got the case. And Letitia James, that's another case altogether. She's a horribly corrupt attorney general, and it's all having to do with election interference. There were no victims, because the banks made a lot of money. They made $100 million. And by the way, I paid approximately $300 million in taxes as the migrants come in and they take over New York. I paid over this period of years over $300 million in taxes, and they want me out. Oh, let's see if we can get them out. These are radical left Democrats. They're lunatics. And it's election interfering. So I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, we'll appeal. We'll be successful, I think, because, frankly, if we're not successful, New York State is gone. People are moving out of New York State. And because of this, they're going to move out at a much faster rate. They used a statute. It's a consumer fraud statute that's never been used for a thing like this before. They used it on me because I'm running for president. I'm beating Biden by a lot. We're beating not only the Republicans were beating Biden by a lot. The poll came out today, we're up 20 points on Biden. If I weren't running, none of this stuff would have ever happened. None of these lawsuits would have ever happened. Nothing would, I would have had a nice life. But I enjoy this life for a different reason. We're gonna make America great again. These are corrupt people. These are people that shouldn't be allowed to do the things they do. And they're using this as weaponization against a political opponent who's up a lot in the polls and always will be, because I'm competing with a man who can't put two sentences together, who doesn't know what he's doing. And we're heading into a third world war because of this guy. We have to win this election. They're doing everything possible to step in a way, but we're not going to stand for it. So thank you very much. We will get back to work. Uh, it's a ridiculous award. Listen, a fine of $355 million for doing a perfect job, for having paid back alone, with no defaults, with no problems. The banks were totally, t you know, at the trial, they testified. We had an expert witness from the Stern School at NYU that made a statement. He, and I was very honored by his statement. He's one of the most respected people anywhere in the country for doing this kind of thing, expert witness. He said, this is one of the greatest financial statements I have ever witnessed before. And he talked about even the detail. So my numbers actually were extremely conservative. They saw this. So what the judge did is he brought down certain values like Mar-a-Lago, made it ridiculous. But the expert, after having all of this, testified to one of the best financial statements he's ever seen. And I was honored by that. But I also knew we have a corrupt judge. He's not a respected man. And again, I said before, he's been overturned on this case by the appellate division four times already. It's a record. Nobody's ever been overturned on one case four times. And I think very importantly, and I think ultimately the most important, we've employed tens of thousands of people in New York, and we paid taxes like few other people have ever paid in New York. And they don't care about that. They, it's, a, it's a state that's going bust. It's a state that's going bust because everybody's leaving. And it's all headed up by Biden, who's destroying our country. So this is Russia. This is China. This is what you've been reading about all your lives. And it's happening right here in our country. Thank you very much. We will stop it. We will make America great again. You have my word. Thank you very much. That is the former President Trump in Mar-a-Lago, who is accusing the judge of being dishonest and part of a DOJ Biden White House plot against him. To be clear, the judge is a state judge, not a federal judge. And in fact, it's Mr. Trump who has been found to have been dishonest in his financial statements uh, and in those applications for loans with Deutsche Bank. Let's bring in Danny Savalos. Danny, can we do a fact check here on the uh, let's begin with? He said he's already been found by an appellate court four times that a, the appeals court has ruled against the judge. What's the what's the reality there? 
Well, that's actually not true because the trial judge here, Justice Ngoron, already ruled against him on summary judgment. That still exists. Uh, the, and the uh, judgment here, uh, obviously, Trump can appeal it, but his statement that the appellate division has somehow ruled against the judge, those might have been on minor issues, but it never stopped the case. The case went forward. I don't want to call them minor issues, but issues of law, they did go up to the appellate division. They came back down. The case progressed. Had the appellate division truly ruled against uh, or overturned Justice Ngoron, presumably the case would have disappeared. So right. that's not exactly a factually true statement. The other thing Trump says is that uh, the law has never been applied this way. This law is applied all the time. There might be an argument that the cancellation of the business certificates is something that isn't always done, or when it is done, it's done when there's an actual victim with loss. But look, there was expert testimony that whether or not uh, Deutsche Bank got on the stand and, and continued to do business with Donald Trump, uh, there was expert testimony that they lost out in significant millions of dollars in foregone interest as a result of the statements of financial condition. Yeah. Uh, he also uh, said that his financial statements were always, in fact, accurate. But it's also true that, um, for example, just on his New York City apartment, he um, overstated the size of it something like three times its actual size. Uh, and according to the bench uh, decision by the, by the judge, in fact, they engaged in financial fraud uh, because they were not accurate on, on many of their financial disclosures. Yeah, I'm going to characterize the Trump team's theory on their statements of financial condition. Uh, their theory was that the statements were fine because these things are always grossly exaggerated. Now, obviously, they didn't use those words, but that's try, I'm trying to boil down their theory, which is that it's New York, in other words. Right. It's New York. Well, there's two things at play. Number one, it's New York real estate, which is amorphous in its valuation. Yeah. But beyond that, it's the Trump brand, which, if you ask Trump, is worth infinity. Uh, yeah. If you ask different people, they might say it's worth different things. So that has been their argument from the beginning, essentially that the SFC's statements of financial condition are good because they could be anything. And furthermore, yeah. that the banks didn't rely on them. They gave it what's called a haircut. When yeah. they got those, they'd take the statement and say, OK, whatever they're saying, we're going to reduce it anyway. But look, they would use that as a starting point. So if they're reducing it, they're using that as a jumping off point. It's still not an accurate statement. And let's also make the point that this New York state law dates back to uh, right after the uh, or, or right after the 1920s uh, stock market crash when they were trying to deal with overinflated uh, valuations. Von Hilliard is outside of Mar-a-Lago right now. Von, who was Mr. Trump speaking to just then? Largely, he's defending not only himself, but also the family empire that was first built up by his father, you know, a good 80 years ago. So for Donald Trump, I mean, there is not only a lot politically on the line, of course, trying to hit not only his supporters, but those voters that may have even voted for Joe Biden in the 2020 election, voted for him in 2016. And he is just trying to defend the integrity of not only his name, but the family business. One that I can't tell you the number of folks I've talked to over the course of the last eight years that said that they were led to Donald Trump because they admired the businessman that he is and was. And you heard Letitia James, the New York attorney general there, say that she and her team of prosecutors were effectively able to prove that for Donald Trump and his allies, including his two adult sons, it was not so much about the art of the deal. Instead, it was the art of the steal. And now you hear Donald Trump make the case that there was no actual victims involved here. But uh, during the proceedings, you heard from the New York attorney general's prosecutors argue that the actions by the former president distorted the market and in some cases priced out other borrowers. And so yeah. for Donald Trump here, he said he is going to appeal this decision. And look, he has two campaign events to Tomorrow, one in the Philadelphia area, one in Michigan tomorrow night. And for him, really winning the White House is perhaps his best chance at reconciling everything that comes from this year. Not only these civil mm -hmm. trials and the fines, the financial penalties, but also the criminal trials that await him. And for him mm -hmm. to be able to prove that if he wins in November, that the American people sided with him despite whatever any judge in any of these uh, trials said. Uh, let's go back to Rahema Ellis in New York. Rahema, uh, I'm guessing that the New York AG is not going to feel the need to engage in a rebuttal with the former president. No, she's already made her statement. And as she said tonight, 
that justice has been served. She said that for years, Donald Trump has engaged in deceptive business practices. And now justice has been served, she says. This was an 11 week trial. This was not a, uh, it went on for 44 days or so. And she pointed out, uh, or it should be pointed out, that this was a bench trial. This was before just Judge in Goron. There was no jury, but that was a choice of the defendant that perhaps they thought that they would do better with a judge and not a jury. And yeah. now there's criticism of this jury. But Letitia James, the state attorney general, says that they showed that there was staggering fraud committed by Donald Trump and the Donald Trump enterprise. And now she said, basically, uh, he will he's being penalized for it. And she said that any other person who's in business who committed this kind of fraud, they would be penalized, too. And he cannot be treated differently from everyone else. Tom? Rahema, thank you. Rahema Ellis, Von Hilliard, and Danny, thank you guys very much for your good analysis. Let's continue on the uh, the situation with the president, former president's many trials because the fate of Fulton County's election interference case against Donald Trump now moves to closing arguments with the evidence wrapping up in just the last hour and a half or so in a hearing that could disqualify the DA there, Fonnie Willis, and her office in the case. In an unexpected twist, uh, Willis opted not to appear today, a day after that fiery testimony where she disputed the timeline put out by an ex-friend about when she started a personal relationship with the special prosecutor she hired, his name Nathan Wade. Instead, we heard today from Georgia's former governor and Willis's own father, who was asked about his understanding of that relationship timeline, Willis and Wade. When you were living at um, Ms. Willis's house in Fulton County, uh, did you ever meet Mr. Wade in uh, the year 2019? Absolutely not. How about in the year 2020? Absolutely not. Did you ever see Mr. Wade at Ms. Uh, Willis's uh, Fulton County house in the year two, uh, 2021? Never. Okay, so the years, they matter here because the Trump team accuses Willis of financially benefiting from an improper relationship with Wade. Though so far, they've not presented any evidence of that. Willis and Wade don't deny a relationship. But when it started matters, since that would go to the heart of any alleged improprieties. MSNBC's Katie Fang is in Atlanta. This has been a long, complicated trial. Walk us through, a hearing rather, walk us through what we learned about the timeline of this relationship from all the witnesses here and about Nathan Wade's credentials. Yeah, so Tom, you, you pointed out one of the most important issues that went on in this evidentiary hearing that began early yesterday morning was the timing of a personal relationship between DA Fonnie Willis and Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. And what we've only heard so far that would be in opposite or in contradiction to what Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade say is the timeline is that testimony that you referenced, which was from that former DA Fulton, excuse me, Fulton County uh, DA's office employee and former friend of Fonnie Willis, who says that that relationship began as early as October of 2019. But former Governor uh, Roy Barnes was called to testify today, and his testimony was really important when it came to why Nathan Wade ended up being the special prosecutor and not him. Take a quick listen. And she asked me if I'd be interested in being special prosecutor, to which I replied that I had mouths to feed at a law office and uh, that I could not, I would not do that. So this fit with the state's case, Tom, because Fonnie Willis went to Roy Barnes first, the former governor, to ask him to serve as a special prosecutor when he turned it down, as you heard, because it was not going to be financially profitable for him. He, she ended up going to Nathan Wade. And so it flies in the face of the defense's theory that Fonnie Willis intentionally set this whole thing up so that she could financially benefit from her personal relationship with Nathan Wade. Yeah, let's be clear. When you say defense, we're talking about the Trump team. Uh, Willis's father also brought up how he has always taught his daughter to use cash. Let's play some of that. Your Honor, I'm not trying to be racist, okay? But it's a black thing, okay? You know, I was trained, and most black folks, they hide cash or they keep cash. I've told my daughter, you keep six months' worth of cash always i've always kept safes and as a matter of fact i gave my daughter uh, her first cash box and told her always keep some cash 
Katie, I heard an analyst yesterday on MSNBC say the same thing. It is culturally an African-American tradition. Many people keep uh, big sums of cash. Why is that significant here? Yeah, because that man right there, the father of D.A. Fani Willis, corroborating her sworn testimony yesterday in court that she kept cash because that's how she was raised by her daddy. And her daddy took the stand today and made it very clear. He was a fantastic witness, Tommy. Came across as credible, came across as very earnest, and he didn't seem like he was trying to cut his daughter any favors. He was very blunt about how he raised her and what he trained her to do. Make sure you have enough cash on hand to take care of yourself and don't rely upon another man to take care of you that fits perfectly with Fani Willis said which is she always reimbursed Nathan Wade in cash and so right now Tom what's the evidence well the only thing we have so far when it comes to the financial impropriety allegations is only things that are good for Fani Willis and nothing that is bad for her yeah she said yesterday I don't need a man's money um, based on what you've heard here how would you expect the judge to rule on whether the DA is in fact disqualified so there's an interesting wrinkle. There's going to be an in-camera hearing by Terrence Bradley, the former divorce attorney for Nathan Wade and the judge and his lawyers on Tuesday. And the reason why that in-camera hearing is going to happen because that attorney-client privilege that was invoked by uh, Nathan Wade to prevent the lawyer, Terrence Bradley, from testifying, the judge wants to hear the scope of what that testimony would have been if it had been elicited for everyone to be able to hear. But really, you know, Terrence Bradley was Credited this afternoon on cross-examination by the state. There were some allegations about his truthfulness, some allegations about, you know, some impropriety that happened at the law firm he shared with Nathan Wade. And so now maybe the judge thinks that there's a credibility problem with Terrence Bradley, and that's going to go into that in-camera hearing on Tuesday. Okay, but let's, can I just for a minute zoom out? Because the bottom line here, as for the bigger case of election interference, the Trump team has argued that the point to all of this is that there was inappropriate action within the DA's office, that the DA hired a special prosecutor because then she got a financial kickback. That's the bottom line. So far, and I've been watching it for a couple days, I haven't heard any evidence or even any witnesses to bring that up or to suggest that. And that's absolutely correct. And in the absence of that evidence, Judge McAfee, if applies the evidence to the law, he should not find that the defense has met its burden to disqualify Fonnie Willis. But remember, the judge is also going to be a fact finder when it comes to credibility, Tom. And if he finds yeah. that Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade officially misrepresented, lied to him in the court, that's definitely not going to help their case. Yeah, that would undermine credibility. All right. Thank you. Katie Fang, thank you. Have a nice weekend. Appreciate your expertise. Let's go to Russia right now. The world-famous opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, is reportedly dead. The country's prison service says Navalny, a prominent critic of President Vladimir Putin, who spent his final years behind bars, died in an Arctic penal colony. He was 47. Already news of his death is drawing outrage from many Western leaders who are pointing the blame squarely at Putin. Take a listen. There's no doubt that the death of Navalny was a consequence of something that Putin and his, and his thugs did. Navalny's wife received a standing ovation at a security conference in Munich today where she issued a strong warning to the Kremlin. I want them to know that they will be punished for what they have done with our country, with my family, and with my husband. And Navalny's life as an opposition leader also put a, a target on his back. He was arrested multiple times, attacked with some toxin with a green dye twice, even poisoned with a military nerve agent that nearly killed him in 2020. And just in December, Navalny went missing before reappearing at that remote Arctic penal colony where he died. We've got team coverage on this. Josh Letterman is in London. Ali Rafa near the White House. Josh, to you we begin. Talk about Navalny's legacy here and how global leaders are reacting to the news. 
Well, his legacy is that of being the de facto leader and really the spiritual force behind the opposition to President Putin's government uh, in Russia, Tom. And while many leaders around the world uh, are not mincing words in terms of uh, assigning culpability to the Kremlin, they are holding back in uh, saying exactly what they think happened, whether this was an assassination or exactly uh, what led to the death of Alexei Navalny. But one person who is is not mincing words is his wife, uh, Yulia Navalny, who was at the Munich Security Conference, coincidentally, when this news broke. Uh, and she issued a plea to the world to what she wants to see now. Take a look. I would like to call upon all the international community, all the people in the world. We should come together and we should fight against this evil. We should fight this horrific regime in Russia today. Tonight, foreign leaders from NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg uh, to the leaders of France and other European nations uh, are insisting that President Putin and the Kremlin now need to explain exactly what happened to Alexei Navalny. Uh, while the foreign ministry here in the United Kingdom has summoned the Russian ambassador, uh, they say they were going to insist that the Kremlin get to the bottom of what happened to Navalny. You know, Josh, I heard a respected uh, Russia analyst here today on TV say there is no opposition anymore in Russia. I mean, you end up dead. And in yeah. fact, most high profile critics are either dead, they're in prison or they're in exile. So is there any future for Russia's opposition right now? If there is, it's going to depend on a leader who hasn't really emerged yet, Tom. We don't have uh, a very obvious successor uh, to Navalny in terms of popularity, name recognition, uh, really public support. Uh, you know, take, take a look at the election taking place less than a month from now in Russia, where President Putin is widely expected to win. Uh, there are a couple of candidates who are in the race uh, who are technically his opponents. They are staunch supporters of Putin and the Kremlin. They have largely backed his agenda. They are not really any threat to him. In fact, the one candidate who was actually threatening his agenda, an anti-war ca candidate, uh, was barred from the election just like Alexei Navalny was. So for right now, uh, there is no obvious choice for who could step up and take the mantle uh, from Alexei Navalny and really pose an actual strong opposition to President Putin as he uh, attempts one more presidential term, Tom. Yeah, and with 400,000 or so dead or wounded Russians from the war. Josh, thank you very much. Josh Letterman, let's go to Ali Rafa at the White House. Ali, the White House is being pretty clear here. Uh, they blame Putin for this. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. We heard the president, the vice president, several administration officials throughout the day clearly lay the blame for Alexei Navalny's death at the feet of Russian President Putin, while also still stressing that the U.S. is still trying to independently confirm these Russian reports of Navalny's death. We heard from the president in remarks at the White House earlier where he praised Navalny's work uh, exposing corruption in the Russian government, fighting for democracy in Russia. Uh, and he also talked about what we could potentially see the Biden administration do next in response uh, to this news about his death. Listen to my colleague uh, Peter Alexander's exchange with the president on this topic. And to be clear, you warned Vladimir Putin when you were in Geneva of devastating consequences if Navalny died in Russian custody. What consequences should he and Russia face? We're contemplating what else could be done, but the, the, what we were talking about at the time, there were no actions being taken against Russia. And that's, look, all this transpired since then. The president saying that his administration is weighing a list of options available. And you heard him talk about all of the things that have transpired since then. One of those things obviously being the start of Russia's war with Ukraine. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, revealing a new detail when she gave uh, remarks at the Munich Security Conference this morning and reacted to Navalny's death about what Russia has paid as a price of that war, saying uh, that an estimated 315,000 Russian troops have been hurt or killed since it began. The president, the president also notably, Tom, during his remarks, used, using that opportunity to push Congress to pass that additional aid to Ukraine to be able to fight Russia's aggression. Mm -hmm. He said uh, that uh, the, the 
history will remember if we do not support Ukraine at this critical time. He also chastised House lawmakers for leaving on a two-week recess before passing that additional aid in addition to border policies. But whether the weight of this news about Navalny's death is actually going to move these lawmakers uh, to not only move, but move as quickly as Ukraine needs them to, that is still unclear at this point, Tom. Yeah, I should point out it's the Ukrainians who say that 400,000 plus Russians have died. The U.S. is saying 315,000 died or uh, dead or injured. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, coming up, how Egypt is now responding to controversy over its pyramid renovation. That's when we come back. We're back, bottom of the hour. In just the last few hours, the DA has filed charges against two teenagers who police say were involved in Wednesday's shooting at the Kansas City Chiefs Victory Parade that left one person dead and 22 others injured or wounded. Two juvenile suspects are now facing firearm and resisting arrest charges, with more charges likely. Police say the two were part of an argument that then turned violent. Meanwhile, survivors today got their first chance to go back to retrieve their personal belongings left behind when the shooting started as the tributes to the victims continue including the woman who was killed, 43-year-old Lisa Lopez Galvan, a popular local radio DJ. A GoFundMe website, uh, has, a fund rather, has been set up by her family, and it's already blown through its goal of raising $75,000, thanks to Taylor Swift, who has donated $100,000 and writing, quote, sending my deepest sympathies and condolences in the wake of your devastating loss. NBC's Maggie Vespa is in Kansas City for us. Maggie, more charges likely against these two teenagers, we understand. And in the meantime, the victims, the wounded, still recovering. They are, and Tom, we also should know more charges likely, but also quite possibly more suspects. Police say they haven't closed the door on that. So again, the investigation continues. But yeah, the pain, as you talked about, I mean, these, these victims are still recovering. Many of them will be recovering for some time. And again, just the emotional turmoil, as we see time and time again in these mass shootings, is immense. Earlier today, speaking of, I talked to one of the youngest wounded, 10-year-old Samuel Ariano. He was at uh, the rally on Wednesday with his family. He he loves Patrick Mahomes. He wanted to see his favorite player on the stage. When he heard the gunshots, this is incredibly heartbreaking. His active shooter training from school kicked in, and he hid behind a garbage can. At one point, though, he says he had to put his hand up over his eyes to shield his eyes from the sun, and that's when he felt a stinging uh, near his rib cage. later realizing that he had indeed been shot. Here's part of our conversation. What did you think when they told you that, that it was centimeters away from your lungs? I started to cry. Why? But, like, I was kind of happy because if it hit my lungs, it would have been a different situation. A whole, like, bad one because I would have started bleeding. Thank God I was bleeding. Like, I wasn't bleeding. Again, he's 10 years old. He's in the fifth grade. I asked what he wants to do when he gets older. He says he wants to play football, maybe be a quarterback. In the meantime, I asked him about his thoughts on the fact that, again, that bullet was just centimeters away from his lungs. And he said the fact that it didn't hit his lungs, Tom, is a miracle. So an incredible kid. But again, the youngest among the wounded, eight years old, Sam close to it. And it's just incredible and heartbreaking to see them impacted like this, obviously. Yeah, he looks like a baby. Uh, it's just just astonishing. Uh, talk about the, the all the money raised to help the family, including this big donation from Taylor Swift. How else uh, are people helping, and how else is money coming in? And by the way, the team response as well. Yeah, yeah, that. The team response, too. Yeah, we'll talk about Taylor Swift. That came in overnight. That surprised us. It was actually two $50,000 donations to GoFundMe because GoFundMe puts a cap on donations. So she donated twice the maximum amount uh, to the family of Lisa Lopez Galvan, who you talked about, a local radio DJ. We talked to her family yesterday who said she's a pillar in the community. Also, we have new photos of Patrick Mahomes visiting girls at a local children's hospital earlier today. Those photos came from the girl's family, the Reyes family, and they also released 
a statement. You see Mahomes and his wife there. The family saying, we're happy to share that our daughters, ages 8 and 10, so some of the youngest victims here, again, are making good progress in their recovery from their leg injuries. Both girls were shot in the legs, underwent surgery, and are currently in cast for several months. The girls were celebrating with many family members when they were senselessly injured. So again, the number of kids injured in this is really what gets you. We had 22 people wounded. More than half of them, Tom, were younger than 16 years old. That says it all. I've got two daughters. It resonates. Maggie, thank you very much. Maggie Vespa. All right, let's get you over now to the five things that we think you should know about tonight. Number one, today the jury started deliberating in the New York civil trial against NRA and his former CEO, Wayne LaPierre. Jurors will decide whether LaPierre took millions of dollars away from the group for himself and whether other execs broke the laws for their own benefit. If the jury finds them liable, they'll recommend how much each person should repay the NRA. LaPierre says he's already repaid what he owes. Number two, Senator Joe Manchin announced today he is not running for president this year after debating him for months. Many speculated Manchin might run after he said he wasn't going to seek re-election to the Senate. Manchin says it didn't feel like this is the right time for him to make a third party bid. Number three, an NBC News exclusive, a whistleblower report sent to Congress today says the top customs and border protection doctor pressured his staff to order fentanyl lollipops for him to bring to a UN meeting in New York. It says he suggested the lollipops would help with pain management in case of an emergency. He ended up not getting the lollipops in time. Number four, the FDA today approved a groundbreaking cancer therapy that could be a lifesaver for people with an advanced form of skin cancer. It's called TIL therapy. In clinical trials, something like 30 to 40% of patients who got it, they saw their cancers shrink or disappear. Number five, hello Martians. NASA looking for more wannabe Martians. It is recruiting people to join its next year long Mars simulation project. Here's the first crew, the first crew before they started. Basically, four volunteers live and they work inside a 3D printed habitat in Houston that's less than 2,000 square feet. It simulates what a mission to Mars might be like, and with simulations of equipment breakdowns and resource limitations and spacewalks, NASA is taking applications through the start of April. But do you get TV? Can you watch the Super Bowl in there? Late today, a top United Nations court denied South Africa's request for urgent measures to safeguard the southern Gaza city of Rafa. This, as we're also getting new satellite images, you can see them there, they appear to show the construction of a wall and other facilities on Egypt's side of its border with Rafa. You see the land has been graded and cleared. The photo on the left and the one on the right were taken just days apart, five days apart. And it corresponds to a video posted by a nonprofit humanitarian group just a few days ago that show, really it shows big construction equipment appearing to that wall. NBC News cannot independently verify when or where that video was recorded. All of this ahead of a possible ground invasion by Israeli forces in Rafah, where more than a million people have taken refuge since Israel's ground invasion started. NBC's Molly Hunter is in Jerusalem. Molly, what else can you tell us? Yeah, Tom, and just to be very clear, NBC News has not confirmed the intention or the purpose of this construction that we are seeing on the Egyptian side of the border. And Egyptian officials are being really tight-lipped. These images have now been circulating for a few days, and the satellite images and video appear to show that Egypt is fortifying its border, basically building a wall, and then clearing a huge amount of space, as you can see in these pictures. And the suggestion by observers is that they are preparing for Palestinian refugees if Israel moves into Rafah. Now, on the Rafah side of the border, and we're talking really within miles because this huge population of 1.4 million displaced Palestinians are shoved right up against that Egyptian border. They are just miles away. There's a statement late tonight, though, Tom, because we've been asking all day, we've been asking for the last couple of days for any explanation of this construction. And Egyptian state information now doubles down on Egypt's previously stated position. They do not support Israel's threatened incursion into Rafah, and they don't want to be seen, and they say they're not doing this, as preparing for the forced displacement of 1.4 
million Palestinian people. They call them their Palestinian brothers in this statement. They've also said that Israeli tanks coming close in any kind of ground invasion or incursion that involves troops coming close to their border really threatens the 1979 peace treaty, which stabilizes the region, but also that border, Tom. Yeah, well, something's going on on that side of the border. Uh, Molly, what is President Biden's response to this potential invasion we're expecting from Israel? He spoke to Netanyahu recently, we know. Yeah, that's right. Another call between the U.S. president and the Israeli prime minister. And for the second time this week, they've gotten on the phone. And for the second time this week, President Biden, in that White House readout, has publicly warned the Israeli prime minister that the U.S. does not support a ground invasion or incursion into Rafa. And he's used very similar language in his statements. He spoke about it earlier this week when he actually met with the Jordanian uh, King, King Abdullah, excuse me, at the White House. He spoke then. And actually, he spoke again today when he was speaking about the death of the opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. He also talked about Rafa. Take a quick listen. I'll talk to you on the back end. I'm hoping that, uh, you, that the uh, Israelis will not make any massive land invasion in the meantime. Um, so it's my expectation that's not going to happen. There has to be a ceasefire temporarily to get those hostages. And by the way, there are, we're, we're in a situation where there are American hostages. Now, many Western allies, Western governments have called on the U.S., have called on the American president to be more forceful, to actually put his money where his mouth is, to use the leverage that the U.S. has to pressure Prime Minister Netanyahu, not only over the ceasefire and hostage release talks, but also about waiting, about not going in. And President Biden has now repeatedly said that not only does the U.S. not support any kind of ground incursion into Rafah, they do not support any kind of incursion without a plan to safeguard the 1.4 million displaced Palestinians. Now, the U.N. and other aid agencies have repeated again and again that it would be catastrophic, that not only do these displaced people have nowhere else to go, it would completely knock out the humanitarian effort, the vital humanitarian effort, but also, Tom, that the loss of civilian life would be massive. Tom? All right, Molly, thank you very much. NBC News hundreds, covers hundreds of other international stories each day, and it's awfully tough to read, watch, or listen to all of them. So our international teams have broken down a few highlights. Here are some of the things they're keeping an eye on, and we call this the global from Bolivia. Today, people there are trying to see what's left of their belongings after heavy rains caused landslides and made houses collapse. Other homes were evacuated because of risk of collapse. Government workers are working to fix cracks in the roads. Local media there say rain this week hit a 20-year record in Bolivia's capital. Out of Egypt, it's scrapping its plan to renovate one of, great, one of the great pyramids of Giza. It was going to reinstall granite, and one antiquities expert there called it the project of the century, but people quickly criticized that plan. So a committee reviewed it and ultimately objected. The man who headed that committee says, don't worry, the pyramids of Giza are safe. And from France, President Macron says, never mind, we're not going to make booksellers on the Seine River remove their stalls for the Olympics. Opening ceremony, Paris police wanted the stalls to be removed for the Olympics for security reasons. But the booksellers pushed back, saying they're a symbol of the city and a tourist attraction. The kiosks have been on the banks of the Seine for something like about 150 years there. Coming up from us, what's happening at the Golden Gate Bridge? That bridge of authorities there, managers say, is already saving lives. That's next in tonight's original. Okay, you know what we do here, original journalism. And so we have one tonight, in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. The Golden Gate Bridge has finished adding nets along the sides. You can see them right there. They're meant to deter people from jumping off the bridge. And bridge managers say they're already helping. The bridge once saw an average of 30 confirmed suicides a year. But in 2023, while the nets were still under construction, there were 14. And now that all nets are in place, the hope is that they can save many more lives. Here's NBC's Jick Ward. The Golden Gate Bridge is an American icon of strength and perseverance, but for too many people, it symbolizes something else. I drove myself here because I felt like I needed to get myself out of pain. I remember seeing him when I stopped and getting off of my motorcycle. He, he appeared to look my direction, and that's when he just went and jumped. So I had yelled something to him. Whatever he yelled, 
was enough to distract me enough and pull me out of that dark place that I was in. I thought he was gone. I went running up there, and then I see his T-shirt through the slots. I talked to him for 92 minutes, and my head never looked up. It was something in his voice, the compassion in his voice, and that's what saved me. Years after Highway Patrolman Kevin Briggs interrupted Kevin Berthea's suicide attempt, Berthea does not shy away from his lowest moment. I wire proudly because I want people to know that your, your worst days prepare you for your best days. On average, 30 people have leapt to their deaths here each year, more than 2,000 since 1937, according to bridge authorities. The first recorded suicide occurred within the first few months of the bridge's opening. And when Briggs started patrolling the bridge in the 90s, part of his job was to look out for people who might be on the edge. I would average four to six people a month who were either on the side Sidewalk, we would see and, and talk to, or maybe in their car writing a note, wow. thinking about it, or up and over that rail. He talked with hundreds of people and helped many of them, sharing the stories in a book called Guardian of the Golden Gate. But it wasn't until now, after years of suicide prevention advocacy and studies of the power of deterrence, that bridge authorities installed these steel nets, a $224 million project. The way the nets are designed, you don't even really see them unless you're right above them. You talk to the few people who survived a jump from the bridge, and almost to a person, they'll say, the second their hands left the railing, their life flashed before their eyes, and they experienced immediate regret. And the nets offer a second chance. The net has a deterrent effect for two reasons. One is it visually interrupts your view of the water. It reminds you that it's there, and other people have been here before you. And two, it's designed to hurt. Falling 20 feet into taut steel mesh is evidently like falling into a cheese grater. It's not going to end your pain. It's going to make it worse. And those two things together are working. In the first year they put this in, before it was even finished, suicides at this bridge fell by half. There's research and study that shows if you're able to get people through the peak of their pain, that often they do not go on to attempt and go on to live long and productive lives. That's true for Kevin Berthea. These two men from opposite sides of the bridge are now friends and peers in suicide prevention. They say these nets are a crucial last line of defense. Something got to be in place. Something, yeah. you know, has to be in place to say that we care. Those folks who come across there and all of a sudden, I've had enough. That's what this will hopefully prevent. Yeah. Then it did its job. And perhaps someday everyone who walks onto the Golden Gate Bridge will walk off. Now, let's be clear, this is not a solution to the mental health crisis that we're seeing in this country and around the world, where suicide rates are, in fact, going up in many cases. And so we're going to need, experts say, a, a total overhaul of how we do mental health. But this kind of architectural intervention really can be effective. And it's not just at the Golden Gate Bridge. This is something we're seeing around the world at icons, uh, sculptures, statues, bridges, towers, all of them putting in this kind of system for exactly the same reason. It visually interrupts and as a result psychologically interrupts that moment that people have and perhaps can get them on a new path. Back to you. Let's hope so. Jake Ward, thank you very much. All right, if you or anybody you, need, you know needs help, you can reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by calling or texting 988. Or you can text HOME to the crisis text line, 741-741. Still to come from us, how one Tulsa community destroyed more than a century ago is now building the next generation of black entrepreneurs. Stay with us. To Tulsa now, where this Black History Month, over a century after a race massacre, when a white mob murdered hundreds of people, burned down homes and looted businesses, wiping out most of the city's black Wall Street district, we bring you a story of one business accelerator that is really investing in black and Latino entrepreneurs working to reclaim what was once taken from the black community in Tulsa. Here's Shaquille Brewster. Vibrant sneakers, powerful art, and deep history run through the walls of this Tulsa business. Sneakers represent community. Sneakers represent creativity. Vanita Cooper, or Coop, owns Silhouette Sneakers and Art. What's the vision behind it? Elegance. Simplicity, warmth. What do you think? I like them. Yeah. Whoa, that price though. <laughs> <laughs> and to help people navigate those prices, Coop founded Arbit, an app that uses an algorithm to help customers identify the best time to buy and sell sneakers on the resale market. 
You could be in the store, see the shoe you like, and use your app to figure out. And determine if, exactly, like, is that what I want to pay? The Enterprises, tucked in the heart of Tulsa's historic Black Wall Street district and part of an intentional effort to grow the sacred neighborhood. We're trying to revitalize the space, build successful businesses down here, and take back you know, what was taken from us. More than a century ago, Greenwood was a prosperous black neighborhood in Tulsa. What did it represent for people? It represented prosperity. It represented venture capitalism before that term was even invented. A, a need for community and taking care of one another because of the deep segregation in Tulsa. But in 1921, a white mob looted, burned, and murdered through the area. The district itself was 36 to 40 blocks, right? All of it got torched. All of it. All of it. A massacre that left hundreds of people dead, more than 1,200 homes destroyed, wiping out decades of black success. They lost everything. They lost uh, that generational wealth. A legacy that both haunts and drives Dominic artists. One of the beautiful things about being in Tulsa is walking around, you can kind of hear your ancestors whisper to you, keep going, double down. Stay disciplined. His Tulsa-based business accelerator program, Act House, uses philanthropic and corporate investments to support black and Latino-led startups. It's $70,000 investment, 0% interest, 0% equity. What does that mean for people? Yeah, it means a lot. The six-month program trains a cohort of founders in Tulsa. After milestones are hit, the cash investment is returned to help a new group of founders. It mimics how the dollar moved in Greenwood, right? It just continues to flow. A flow that accelerated Coop's business. What Act House and this community have given to me is confidence and belief. And it's very easy to lose those things. And in what some might call fate, her shoe store stands on the footprint of a black-owned shoe shop. Right here. Wow. Am I crazy? That was destroyed in the massacre. Being on Black Wall Street helps to give me perspective. Perspective of where we come from, the challenges that we have had to overcome in the past, and then it gives me appreciation. Appreciation for past success and tragedy, fueling a present day resurgence. Shaquille Brewster, NBC News, Tulsa. That's how you pay it back and pay it forward. And that is a wrap for this hour. A programming note on the news this week that Russia is developing a nuclear space-based weapon. We are airing our special tonight, Battlefield Space to the Moon and Beyond. We're awfully proud of it. 9 o'clock Eastern Time right here on NBC News Now and streaming on YouTube. Meanwhile, the news continues right now on News Now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.